Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sri Radha Dattu, for your kind introduction. You have always remained a sanguine voice in our neighborhood. And thank you also, Professor P. R. Kumaraswamy, Honorable Director, uh, Middle Inst Institute, who has asked me to deliver the talk. And it's really a pleasure to have such a, an august gathering as an audience, and I would really benefit out of them from their perspectives. I begin my talk by paying tributes to Begum Rokia Shakawat Hussein, the pioneer of women's liberation in South Asia, who was born today in 1880 in Rangpur, Bangladesh, and passed away the same day today in 1932 in Kolkata, India. Soon after the corona outbreak began in March, all economic activity in the country came to a sudden halt. But even in this situation, the flow of remittance didn't stop. Rather, expatriates have sent more remittance to the country than ever before, before which has given impetus to a contracted economy contributed to helping the country's foreign exchange reserve, crossing the $41 billion mark in October, for which we have the latest statistics, according to the central bank, the Bangladesh bank. The growth in remittance inflows, which remained upward even amid the COVID-19 pandemic, however, slowed down in October. This reflects the consequences of a fall in Bangladesh's labor exports amid a global economic crisis. In October, the year-on-year -year remittance growth dropped to 28.62% from 45.64% in September, according to the Central Bank. Even though remittance growth has started slowing slightly, the World Bank is optimistic about an upward trend in the coming days for Bangladesh. The World Bank, in its recent report titled Migration and Development Brief, projected that Bangladesh would be among the top 10 remittance recipients globally this year. Remittance is the second largest source of foreign exchange, as you know, after the ready-made garment sector in Bangladesh. Although the clothing is the largest source, huge sums of money go out of the country to pay for the raw materials used to make those products. The other sources, obviously, uh, uh, foreign exchange uh, are overseas development assistance or ODA and foreign direct investment. All in all, foreign exchange reserve and its effectiveness through expatriate income is much higher. Expatriates in different countries send a large portion of their income to families in the country. And this money not only meets the basic needs of their families, but also plays an important role in the economic development of the country by investing in various fields. This can be understood by looking at changes in the areas from which the expatriates have migrated more. Most of the money sent by expatriate is spent on building homes, buying flats or land. The standard of living and per capita expenditure of the people of the expatriate in inhabited district is also higher than the people of other districts. Evidence of which is found in, if you go to, go to districts like Kumilla, Chitong, Tangail, and Noakhali. Most of the expatriates from Bangladesh have migrated from these districts. In the overall socioeconomic development of the country, remittance sent by expatriates is improving the economy much deeper than, than due to remittance coming out of exports, foreign investment and development cooperation. This is the growth story of Bangladesh despite many interpretations, including lamentations, such as surprise, paradox, or basket case. This was made possible in large part by migration of underemployed from the countryside to urban cities and flowing out to the world over, mostly concentrating into West Asia or Middle East Asia that you were call, calling. The, Continual greater than before participation of women in the labor market, particularly in the RMZ sector, as well as women entrepreneurship and 
demonstrated resilience of farmers have continued to work tirelessly in their green crop lands, exhibiting innovation and intensity have been responsible for new and inspired changes. The remittance from home and abroad has fueled largely the consumption-led economic growth. The consumption is one of the four elements, as you know, of gross domestic product or GDP, and the, the others are investment, government expenditure, and the net ex of export and import. The introduction of consumption-based tax, value-added tax, has resulted in high capacity of the government to undertake public investment. Nevertheless, the public investment to social sector has remained less than the countries that have witnessed transformational changes, with the quality of education and health remaining in question. Yet the people at large have endured one of the highest out-of-pocket expenditure in South Asia and comparable countries in education and health to achieve progress in social sector. This high consumption expenditure has reached such a high level that ordinary people's ability to save has remained at the low level. As a result, investment have not increased, rather remaining stagnant over several years. The lack of productive expansion has left a major portion of the labor force unemployed or underemployment, resulting in jobless growth. Coming back to the topic, Bangladesh is the world's 11th largest recipient of remittance from migrant workers, with over 10 million Bangladeshi migrants working in 160 countries and sending money to family members at home. While most of these migrants are documented, irregular migrants such as the 200,000 undocumented Bangladeshis in Malaysia also make a significant contribution to remittance. The remittance from migrant workers represent around 7% of Bangladesh's GDP. During the global COVID-19 pandemic, lockdowns and border closes, closures have heavily impacted migrant workers, many of whom have been unable to return to Bangladesh. Of those unable to return, irregular migrants are particularly vulnerable. They are forced to live in overcrowded conditions and live in constant fear of arrest and deportation, nor do they have access to information and services related to diseases. The most critical issues faced by migrant workers during this pandemic are, are the adverse employment outcomes, including loss of employment, waste cuts, furlough, underemployment, and waste theft. These adverse employment outcomes are due to the high concentration of migrants in sectors most vulnerable to COVID-19, such as manufacturing, tourism, hospitality, and travel. And this is also true for other uh, migrants from South Asia as well. Moreover, the concentration of migrants in low skilled jobs and the nature of employment contracts, their income and education level, and their living conditions associated with low skilled jobs further add to their vulnerability. Specifically, poor working and living conditions of low skilled migrant workers make physical distancing almost impossible. Such vulnerability is further heightened by the strategies adopted by the Middle Eastern countries before and during the pandemic. For, for example, the limited opportunities available for migrant workers to assimilate leads to issues in access to healthcare, employment protection, and welfare. During the pandemic, less assimilated migrant workers have been found to be worse off in terms of accessing testing and treatment. Similarly, the inward looking policies of countries in the Middle East, especially during the pandemic, have discriminated against migrant workers during layoffs and rehiring. As such, job losses and growing anxiety are causing a large number of migrant workers to return to their home in Bangladesh as well as countries in South Asia. It may well be that Bangladesh will face a larger number of returned workers over the next few years. In addition to the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, a slump in global oil prices may lead to around 1 million Bangladeshi migrant workers returning from Saudi Arabia between now and 2025. That's what some projections say. Given that the existing health, psychological, and financial impact of COVID-19 on returned migrants and their families may well increase their vulnerability, as the International Organization for Migration has called for more proactive measures to be taken by governments worldwide 
to ensure the mental health and psychological needs of migrants and displaced persons are met, regardless of their legal status. Without remittance incomes, jobs, and social protection coverage, migrant households engraced in distressed asset sales to solve food shortages and meet immediate needs during the lockdown. Moreover, many are likely to remain highly indebted due to high migration costs incurred and untimely return. According to the Central Bank, more than 65% spend Bangladeshi taka 300,000 as migration cost. Another 20% pay more than 500,000 taka to go abroad. Bank loans, loan finance, 65% of migration cost, according to another research organization. As remigration is a difficult option now, the return of migrant workers to rural districts combined with low income opportunities and piling debts can potentially put pressure on rural economies as well as cre create poverty pockets, especially in migrant prone areas. Furthermore, this is within the a context where Bangladesh's poverty rate is likely to climb, as our estimates suggest, from 20.5% to even to 44% following the pandemic. So these would be COVID-19 induced new poor, ranging from say 16 to 42 million people. These are these are great detail discussed in our forthcoming book, COVID-19 and Bangladesh, Response Rights and Resilience, to be published by the University Press Limited, which, is, which has also brought together young, young scholars from Bangladesh and Australia. Bangladesh's manpower exports are mainly concentrated in Middle East, as you know, last year to, in, to, during 2019, 90% of the total workers who went abroad went to Middle Eastern countries, 56% of workers went to Saudi Arabia. Last year, about 7 lakh workers went to different countries, 3 lakh 99,000 of them went to Saudi Arabia. Besides, 82,754 workers went to Oman, 50,292 to Qatar, and 49,729 to Singapore, according to Bureau of Manpower, Employment, and Training of the Government of Bangladesh. Of the workers who went abroad last year, 44% were skilled workers. It is argued, but these statistics has never been really validated. So Bangladesh has become dependent on Saudi Arabia due to the long halt in labor exports to Malaysia and the United Arab Emirates. Saudi Arabia, as the industry insiders say, is now threatening to expel Bangladeshi workers. Not only that, they have also made an issue out of the Rohingyas. In the last six months, 40,494 expatriate Bangladeshis have been forced to return from Saudi Arabia after serving various terms and losing their jobs in jails. Uh, uh, the United Arab Emirates has been the second largest labor market destination for Bangladesh in the Middle East. In 2008, a maximum of 400,000 and uh, uh, workers went to that country until 2012, more than two lakhs, which is 200,000, went to the country every year. However, the UAE suddenly stopped hiring workers from the, from, uh, from the end of 2012 on the pretext of security. At present, the country doesn't issue visas for any occupation other than domestic work. In 2019, only 300, uh, 3,361 cars went to UAE. Earlier in 2017, 3,235. 3, so you could see the level. Uh, Kuwait's labor market for Bangladesh is closed in late 2006. Although the deployment of workers has been limited since 2014, it is insufficient compared to the de demand countries. Labor market is occupied mainly by Sri Lankans, Nepalese, Indians, and the Philippines. Last year, only 12,219 workers went to Kuwait, and this year it is merely 1,843. Only one worker has been sent to Bahrain, and this year, last year, it was 133 people. So you could understand this, that this is, and, and, and to my friend in Lebanon, and this, this situation would be lower than that. 
Last year, uh, 4,073 uh, 4, 4, workers were sent to the two countries uh, in, uh, in Lebanon and, and Egypt, respectively. In addition, due to political instability, it was not possible to send workers to Libya, Sudan, and Iraq. As per International Monetary Fund, major host countries like Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Kuwait were reeling from the 2014 and 16 oil price collapse with modest recovery prospects in 2020. On the other hand, a push for workforce nationalization programs in Gulf GCC economies like Saudi Arabia contributed to the layoffs of Bangladeshi migrant workers. COVID-19 really jolted a recovery prospects in the region. I am a focus GCC economies to contract by 7.6% in 2020. The pandemic's fallouts, including collapse in OPEC plus negotiations and ensuring oil price war, which is led by Saudi Arabia, further weakened the oil dependent economies as they saw oil prices even crash to an 18 year low. While OPEC plus groups call truce to curb oil production, it has not helped revive price meaningfully. After the GCC, the export of workers was to Malaysia and that too has been stopped for almost two years. In 2016, almost 100,000 workers went to their country. As the insiders say, a ring formed by 10 Bangladeshi recruiting agencies grabbed several thousand crores of rupees. Uh, due to these allegations, the recruitment of Bangladeshi workers was stopped from September 2016. Last year, only 545 people went to that country. Multiple high-level meetings have been taken place between Bangladesh and Malaysia uh, to resume labor export, but didn't really yield any significant results. However, there is demand for workers in the Malaysian labor market, which is constantly being occupied by workers from India, Philippines, Indonesia, and even from China. Now moving to another area, which is according to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee, UNHCR, more than 2 million people have crossed the Mediterranean into Europe between 2014 and April this year. Among them, there are more than 19,000 Bangladeshis. Bangladeshis. Bangladesh is also in the top 10 of the list of countries whose citizens tend to cross the Mediterranean to enter Europe. So far, many Bangladeshis have unfortunately died while crossing the risky, illegal, and dangerous path. The human traffickers dragged all of them to this perilous path by showing greed for or financially comfortable life. For this reason, the immigrants had to hand over the money obtained from the sale of loans and land to human traffickers and brokers. So let's now look at the skill level. According to the data, 82% of the migrant workers from Bangladesh are semi-skilled or unskilled. Although 34% are said to be skilled, there are doubts about how well trained they are, Bangladeshis do not get good jobs abroad due to, as I said, lack of skills, get paid less than the workers in other countries. The most important thing is to generate skilled human resources. The government, along with other agencies, must take immediate steps to develop an inclusive, equitable, and people-centered sustainable action plan to socially and economically by giving an easy access to loan and other necessary financial benefits and supports so that they, these my returning migrants can reintegrate it, as well as they can really have this process of reintegration went on. And also there is a need for this uh, further reskilling and skill development training. Initiative have been taken to set up 61 new technical training centers. In this context, the emphasis has been in on quality immigration. To this end, the authorities have emphasized on creating a strong database for migrant workers, ensuring safe migration of women migrants, safety of migrant workers, and sending remittance legally, and expediting the implementation of development projects and resolve the crisis. The Ministry of Expatriates, Welfare and Overseas Employment has been exploring new labor markets for several years. To this end, labor market research is being conducted in 53 countries with 
low birth rates and declining workforce following which work has already begun to send some manpower uh, uh, to Sicilies and Mauritius. The ministry has increased contracts in Pol Poland, Algeria and Japan with a view to creating a faster alternative labor market. Diplomatic efforts are underway to include these countries in the labor market. So responses have also been received from several European countries as new, as new labor markets. In those countries where the birth rate is low, the working manpower is more likely to be reduced. In the coming days, the concerned people see the possibility of labor market in those countries. A recent report by World Bank also suggested that there are new markets for manpower exports to maintain the flow of remittance to the South Asian countries, including Bangladesh. Uh, the report highlights several different perspectives on the future analysis of manpower export. The first of these states, the number of migrants from South Asian country would be to East Asian countries like South Korea, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Japan, etc., uh, because there is an increasing trend and it is said in that report by 20, 2026, the rate of migrant workers from these countries may increase by 12%. As of that time, it might be that 100,000 new migrant workers may enter the East Asian economies. The adverse foreign employment outcomes are not really specific to the COVID-19 pandemic. I must uh, make it clear. They are mainly due to the unfavorable employment and migration situation endured by migrant workers even prior to the pandemic. The onset of the pandemic only exacerbated and highlighted these unfavorable outcomes across multiple dimensions. The rise in number of returning and returned migrants worker add to the stress, stress of the already weak uh, labor markets, which have limited absorption capacity at home this situation also challenges the waning resilience of the households, communities, and societies. As such, the decline in remittance and foreign employment opportunities have adverse implications on the welfare of migrant workers and their left behind family members. So first, I would outline two, three issues that can be that in, in terms of South Asia, we can uh, take it forward. So one would be to renegotiate the importance of allowing migrant workers to assimilate in host countries. The South Asian countries need to really harness the collaborative strength of regional and global fora and frameworks such as the Abu Dhabi Dialogue, Colombo Process, Global Forum of Migration and Development. So, uh, so and they can also, the South Asia region has experienced large inflow of returned and repatriate migrant workers often with pending dues from employers, individual migrant workers and sending countries will have limited capacity to claim these dues and redress migrant workers' plight. As such, it is important for South Asian countries to collectively demand for a redress mechanism of this returned and repatriate migrant workers. So there could be initiative to this end as well. Now let me uh, 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 talk about what has been done with regard to migrant workers. The expatriate welfare overseas employment policy 2006, which is the key national policy, provides for rehabilitating, rehabilitating return migrant workers. Bangladesh has been prioritizing always outgoing migrants over returnees. In 2015, ILO documented key challenges for returnees, which are lack of information on business trend, job opportunities, opportunities, barriers in access to formal credit, and absence of advisory services. Uh, as a quick response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the government of Bangladesh has set up an emergency fund of uh, Bangladeshi Taka 2 billion for returnees and has allocated Bangladeshi Taka 200 million in each in cash incentives for standard workers. Moreover, returnees can take, take loans of up to uh, Bangladeshi Taka 500,000 at a 4% interest rate from Probashi Kullan Bank, the only state-owned bank that provides financial assistance to the returnees. Furthermore, in the national budget of 2020 and 2020, the current fiscal year, another Bangladeshi Taka of 5 billion has been allocated for strengthening and extending loan facilities to the needy. 
So now let's go back, going back to the uh, macro picture. The COVID-19 pandemic has posed unprecedented challenges throwing the economy off the guard at a time when the country is stepping onto its 50th year of independence. There has evidently been a reversal of the gains made in terms of socioeconomic progress due to the economy's fundamental weakness in absorbing shocks, which has been further aggravated due to the pre COVID-19 fault lines. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed cracks in the structure of Bangladeshi society well beyond the contraction of its economy. The poverty rate, which had decreased in recent years, may exhibit, as I said earlier, an upward movement for the first time since 1992. The poverty rate may increase, as I mentioned, to up to a certain level. A ma major portion of the middle class have suffered unprecedented loss. Around 95% of the employed population have lost a massive share of their salaries and 51% of workers are currently economically inactive and out of, out of job, as many research suggests. Analyzing the path to recovery, however, is more important than analyzing the recovery of the economy itself. And this is critical. In this regard, two important questions need to be explored. Firstly, how intended recovery will be carried out, and secondly, what kind of recovery it will be. Although there is mass speculation on the process of the recovery, the analysis required is the type or nature of the recovery trajectory. So that's important. Here, here I would just give you a, a, a kind of an, make an, an attempt, and then I will finish it. So recovery, as you all are aware of the deemed to be following either any of this English alphabetical alphabets, A, U, V, or W shape. Optimists project a rapid and quick recovery to the previous growth path resembling a V-shaped curve, curve. Nevertheless, the nature of the recovery relies on the process by which the recovery will be carried out. The determinants of recovery are set by the policies which is adopted by the government government of that particular country. Two different routes of recovery will be visible if the government adopts, uh, 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 adopts uh, active restraint measures or if it ordains an active inaction or business as usual measures in policy. In my framework, I have assumed four major conditions and these conditions include presence A, presence of public goods provision, redistributive policies and actions, that's second, then macro financial interventions, and fourth is structural policy reforms. If these conditions are met, the resources and economic benefits and opportunity will obviously reach all the citizens without being concentrated in the hands of a few groups or a clientelistic network. As a result, the recovery trajectory will not only be discriminatory, but will lead to a relatively low inequality equilibrium. But if these four conditions are not met in the government's recovery policy, the economy will traverse on a path of extreme discriminatory recovery. And the recovery trajectory will gradually take the form of the English letter K, which unfortunately we do not want to see that when Bangladesh is stepping to celebrate its golden jubilee anniversary. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Thank you. I will try to respond any questions and I hope to get certain comments which would really enlighten me from this August gathering. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.